I'll talk a little bit today about uh, uh, what we, what type of research we are currently conducting uh, on this uh, type of microprotein product, and uh, mainly also the outlook towards the future. Uh, there. And so, as, as Jim very nicely explained, so this is a consortium of many, many parties. And uh, 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 the interesting thing is that uh, what is also clear from all these parties is that they all have different products, so that they will focus on different, different type of requirements for the final product. And that is, of course, very important. Eh? So, uh, because if we if we just try to go a little bit back and, and look at the whole uh, uh, plant protein product development or potentially alternative protein product development, as Jim also indicated, in the past, there were quite a few challenges uh, in this field. Eh? So, uh, uh, not everybody has been uh, developing always cost-effective products. Uh, this is uh, uh, already uh, improved at the moment. Uh, 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 a lot of off notes uh, and uh, taste defects were present in, in previous products that were sent to the market. And that usually resulted in uh, a masking, uh, so addition of masking ingredients, and therefore uh, 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 quite a few sometimes had to be added. And therefore, the, the label, uh, uh, the ingredient uh, listing became rather long, which was not always appealing to consumers. And not all the products had the type of nutrients uh, that should be in there. I think uh, an, a nice example is the shortage of vitamin B12 in some of these products. And uh, also uh, there is, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, unclarity on uh, effective preservation of these type of products. And that, of course, results in, in a potentially limited or a non-shelf life that has to be further developed uh, for these type of products. And uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, all challenging and new. And that, in the whole, resulted in a rather uh, uh, complicated and time consuming uh, new product development process. And I just want to uh, today give you a little bit of an overview on the, um, the whole field as we see it and uh, uh, how this specific project fits in uh, uh, as we conducted at Wageningen research and the type of technologies that we use to, to, to meet these type of challenges. And so, uh, as we see it, um, uh, there's uh, uh, three ways of using microorganisms for alternative protein. Huh? Uh, the first one is clearly the one uh, of the discussion today, that is using a, a whole microbial biomass. And that means that you cultivate microorganisms directly, uh, that, uh, as Jim also nicely indicated, that leads to a rather high yield uh, on the uh, uh, media. Uh, components, so you can produce it very efficiently, very uh, much continuously also, and so that uh, allows for a very efficient process. Alternative processes that are also used a lot in the market are the, the production of recombinant proteins, uh, and I think there's quite a few also nice examples of companies that do this. Uh, I think uh, the Perfect Day is one of the uh, 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 one of the examples that is there that try to make an alternative milk or dairy type product. Uh, by uh, producing, overproducing specific proteins, uh, in their case, uh, dairy type proteins, uh, uh, to uh, mimic the actual applications of the animal type product. And you can imagine uh, that this process uh, may result in very high quality products, of course. It is, however, a little bit less cost efficient, uh, obviously, as you produce these proteins in a specific reactor and not all the proteins and all the biomass uh, that is produced can be used directly for consumption, but only the specialty proteins. And a third one is, is classical fermentation. And that uh, really looks at uh, looking uh, uh, plant-based ingredients and converting these uh, uh, into foods and, and use fermentation for that. Huh? And so fermentation can be used to reduce specific off flavors, uh, sometimes uh, uh, change the amino acid composition of these type of products and uh, improve the overall digestibility of these products. Uh, and so at, at Wageningen Research, we focus on all these three topics, but the uh, uh, current main topic of interest is of course the first one, the formation of microbial biomass of which we also think this is a very interesting field and uh, very clear. So uh, uh, you uh, cultivate whole microorganisms directly for consumption. Um, and you can, uh, of course, use fractions or the whole biomass, uh, 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 both. Uh, so if you're either looking at the fiber-rich uh, uh, part or the protein-rich part, in general, 
uh, I think there's a, a lot of preference on using the whole biomass in the direct applications as much as possible. Uh, we think this has a very high potential due to a few reasons. Huh? So uh, uh, this, uh, we see this as an efficient way to upcycle specific residues, huh? as is also done in the enough process where uh, 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 side streams are, so to say, used to upcycle uh, 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 the, the, the uh, nature of these uh, uh, streams and ensure that you get a very high quality food grade product. This in general also uh, can have a very high protein content, uh, uh, far over 40% and a little even uh, uh, higher than that in some cases. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we are currently able to select uh, uh, organisms that have specific characteristics. Uh, so this may be a very good amino acid profile, maybe have a very good uh, texture for specific application to really uh, get that uh, uh, the characteristic in the final food uh, that you would like to have. And currently there's only a, a limited amount of microorganisms on the market uh, there. Uh, uh, and so we think there's much potential to, to widen this to a wide variety of applications. And that is why uh, we at Wageningen Research are so interested in this specific field. Um, I think what is important to realize huh, is that in this case, a specific uh, a fungal protein is used, but uh, uh, that the, the field is, is much wider than that. Uh, so uh, uh, at the moment, there's also a lot of uh, uh, yeast uh, uh, protein uh, produced. Uh, I think mainly Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but also quite a few other species there. And they are usually produced uh, uh, to gather a lot of yeast biomass or yeast extract, uh, as it is usually uh, called. And this results in a lot of microbial protein. And this is already done at a very large scale. So also shows that this type of processes can be run rather easily and very efficiently year to year, high quality uh, 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 to produce this type of food grade ingredients. Um, a lot of other similar processes uh, can also be used for specific applications. Uh, so there's uh, quite a few processes, and these are bacterial processes that are generally run to produce uh, specific vitamins like folic acid or vitamin B12 production, uh, but also those side streams, uh, so uh, biomass, microbial biomass is a side stream there that can be used for microbial protein. It can also be that you want to look at specific uh, 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 other type of products that are in the biomass. Huh? And so you could also focus on high fatty acid type of microorganisms. And so high oil containing microorganisms like Chiroia lipolitica, that is a much more uh, high oil content and the protein could be a co-product there or side product, so to say. Uh, of course, you could also use the whole biomass here. Other types of processes, uh, uh, for example, produce a specific product that you might want to have. Uh, and I think a nice example there is from uh, Monilella pollinus that is uh, produced at a very large scale at the moment uh, or used for erythritol production. And you get a lot of biomass as a co-product there. Uh, so it can also be used. Uh, so all these type of examples show that, this, uh, that there's a lot of space to maneuver in this market and a lot of potential for using microbial biomass. And of course, uh, 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 I also still have a slide on uh, enough, of course. Uh, this was already very nicely introduced uh, by Jim, so I'm not going to redo that. Uh, but very clearly, uh, this is an example where you uh, grow uh, a microprotein from sustainable sugars uh, from grain, uh, and you make that into a food product. So as uh, environmental as it gets and as much use of all the uh, uh, nutrients of the streams uh, that are in there. So a uh, very highly efficient, impressive uh, process. And uh, uh, what we are doing at Wageningen Research is, uh, of course, we're trying to compare this microprotein to other types of benchmark products. So uh, uh, this could be to a plant uh, type protein, but also to the other type of microbial biomass type of products uh, to see uh, what are the, the, the advantages, uh, uh, what uh, uh, may be improved, what type of processes do we need to really get to the right characteristics. Uh, and so there's, I think, a few things that are relevant there. Of course, you have to be able to extrude it uh, for some applications. Uh, 
to uh, you want to look at the microprotein solubility uh, because that also uh, indicates uh, for what type of applications you can use it in the end. Uh, the nutri nutritional bioavailability is of course very relevant. Uh, so how does it compare to the uh, 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 very well described uh, dairy and soy type of applications? Uh, do you also get these high uh, DIAS uh, type of scores? Uh, and of course, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, can you also preserve it correctly and how to optimize that? Uh, and that, those are all unknowns at the moment for these types of applications. So let me just very shortly walk you through a few slides so that you get a very general idea on what we are doing here. Unfortunately, today we do not have time to go into the real details, uh, but just a very high over, overview on this. Um, so uh, uh, extrusion has been uh, tried uh, and both uh, low moisture extrusion, uh, uh, which worked very well, uh, but also high moisture extrusion was successful uh, if this was used in combination uh, with uh, another uh, protein source uh, at the moment. And so uh, we think we are able to get uh, a quite uh, a nice uh, intermediate products out of this that can be used for uh, real product formation after the extrusion process. So that already shows that uh, 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 one can work quite nicely with the material and use it already for uh, various applications there. And this is currently explored in a lot more detail uh, by our department. Uh, we've also looked at the uh, 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 solubility and the water holding capacity. Uh, uh, and uh, on the right top, I'm not going to go into detail there also, but this is the general uh, experimental design that we used uh, over there. So you can just read that back uh, as I saw that the slides will be available at a later stage. Um, um, uh, what was very clear is that the solubility overall uh, is a little bit on the low side, uh, uh, but there was a clear pH dependency of the uh, solubility, at, at least at, at, at high temperatures, so at 90 degrees. Um, uh, 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 what we also see is that the water holding capacity uh, is rather high, and especially at high pH. So there's a clear uh, pH dependency of the water holding capacity where we see at pH 9 that the water holding capacity is much higher than at uh, a neutral pH, uh, and of course also much higher than at acidic uh, pH. Um, additionally, it seems to be uh, uh, slightly higher at room temperature than at 90 degrees. Uh, uh, overall. So that also indicates uh, that at a room temperature, uh, uh, well, the, the water holding capacity uh, is increased overall. If we look at the amino acid uh, profile and compare that to whey protein, huh, which has a very high amino acid score, of course, uh, very well known, then we see uh, that the uh, comparison shows that overall, and especially for the essential amino acids, these are rather comparable if you uh, look at the uh, amount of amino acids per total gram of protein. And so for the histidine, uh, threonine, uh, lysine, etc., the, these concentrations are overall roughly the same. And so that uh, uh, we are still looking at the final amino acid score and we'll look at a protein digestibility in the end. But so far, this looks quite acceptable uh, uh, for uh, such a product. And at least uh, uh, it looks definitely better than some of the other products that we have used and seen in the past. Then finally, um, uh, uh, of course, shelf life. And we, we didn't do the shelf life studies yet. So I'm just trying to give a very general example of how we approach this. So in the past, we have looked at, at sheet casings, uh, which is, of course, something different. But this is just an example uh, that you can also read up in detail in this publication that's indicated over here. And uh, uh, so what we generally do is we use uh, high throughput assays where we look at various parameters in a full matrix. So for this example, we looked at five soil concentrations, four temperatures, and four uh, pHs, and used that in a complete matrix to see what the effect was on uh, 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 microstability. And you can imagine that if you have five salt concentrations, four temperatures, and four pH conditions, that you, in a total matrix, you have 80 different conditions. And then we wanted to test a few microorganisms. 
uh, uh, during a longer time period in which we inactivated these microorganisms, uh, uh, which were inoculated on these type of sheep casings. Uh, and these were all pathogens. Uh, as you can see, uh, and in total, you can imagine we uh, have to do a lot of viability analysis. So I think uh, in, this, in this project, in total, we did uh, one over 20,000 uh, uh, colony forming unit uh, uh, assays. So really a lot of data there. And all that data, of course, I'm not going to show in these slides. But the summary of those data is, is that some organisms uh, 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 can be calculated then subsequently to be very sensitive to specific parameters, whilst for others they are not sensitive at all. And I think a nice example is that most of the pathogens are very sensitive to salt, as is always expected. So Staphylococcus aureus, Shisha coli, and Salmonella are very sensitive to salt. But uh, Listeria, surprisingly, is not so sensitive uh, to salt at all. And even more surprisingly, uh, 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 Listeria is very sensitive to the temperature, but in a way that was not expected at all in this example. So uh, at higher temperatures, uh, Listeria was inactivated faster uh, than at low temperatures. And uh, you have to realize that in an industrial setting, these type of sheep casings are always uh, kept at low temperature to uh, inactivate most of the organisms as fast as possible. And as you can see, for most of the organisms, this has no effect. And if it has an effect, it actually has a negative effect to keep this at low temperature. So this is how we approach this type of research using high throughput technologies. And so that brings me uh, in the view of time to, my, uh, to the future outlook. So there's a lot that we still have to study, obviously. Uh, we're just at the start of the, our initiative here. And so the uh, uh, range of things that we will do is, is study uh, further study the solubility, uh, color and texture and water holding capacity of the, uh, the new batch materials uh, and also look at batch to batch variation there to see um, how uh, uh, well uh, we can get that. Uh, we will also look uh, a little bit more at uh, the effects of mechanical pretreatment on the solubility and water holding capacity. Um, uh, and study the effect of specific additions and uh, uh, on the solubility and water holding capacity. Uh, uh, and a range of other uh, uh, applications. Um, uh, and finally, uh, I think uh, the, there'll be a lot of focus on uh, looking at the, the uh, in vitro digestibility of the material. And of course, finally, also on the impact of the gut microbiome to see what the effects are as compared to other uh, plant type of protein uh, products. And we think that especially the influence of anti-nutritional factors uh, may be of high interest there. So, um, uh, well, this is, I think, uh, where I remain for today. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much, Martijn, um, for a great presentation, a great overview about the project, as well as on the bigger picture. And this is always very important, right, because this is part of a evolution, and there's more, more side steps that you can take. But I think you've also great, done a great job in explaining what you really do in such a project, right? And what you research and what the contribution is for this project to really make it make it happen. So yeah. thanks a lot. Um, I don't see any questions now in the chat. Um, I want to maybe suggest, Martijn, if that's OK with you. Well, let's take one question because we are, I'm conscious of time, maybe at uh, 5.30 to close. Some questions can be taken later on the chat by you, right? But let's yeah, sure. uh, do the question of Marcel van der Vaart with the Cosum company. He's asking in a B2B setting, can the customers cope or want to work with wet ingredients or is there a preference for dry? So it's a food industry question about what they would prefer, uh, dry or wet. Oh, uh, I see an, an additional uh, question to that in relation yeah. to microstability. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it's a great uh, uh, question. Huh? And uh, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to answer this question uh, 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 because I'm a little bit more on the research side. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in relation to microstability, I can say that for all the type of uh, uh, applications, so both for the wet and the uh, uh, dry uh, type of product, uh, uh, I think we'll look at the microstability uh, because uh, the, the, the amount of water that is in a product will definitely influence the microstability. I, I hope that mm -hmm. is a little bit in the right direction. And Jim, maybe you can add a little bit to that, uh, to the first uh, part of that question. 
Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, Marcel. And we do acknowledge that the first question we get from a lot of customers initially is, can you make it dry? And clearly the answer with everything is, of course, we can make it dry. But um, I think the the world's food and the meat industry has handled wet. Most of the meats are 75 percent moisture and uh, the, the, the meat industry has handled that wet and the micro load of wet for its entire history. Um, and therefore, I think the, the fundamental efficiency of retaining in wet is embraced by a majority of customers. I, I'm aware that of some of the other people that are producing microprotein uh, have, have directed themselves more towards dry than enough has. We, mm. we still think that for meat and meat, meat alternative and fish alternative applications, the fundamental merits of the product in its in its wet format are easy to use. Um, we acknowledge that for some applications, um, uh, maybe in, in dairy applications, uh, dairy alternatives, then there's a higher desire for dry. And so we have, after five years of saying no, we've eventually dried some in the last couple of months. Um, okay, thank you so much. I think a very clear answer uh, to the question um, of, of concern. Uh, have a fantastic uh, rest of the morning or maybe a dinner wherever you are and hope to see you soon again and thank you once again.